Welcome back to Ali, Atrévete a lo Imposible, Season 2, Episode 7. This is our season finale. We'd definitely like to thank everyone for tuning in this season. Today, we have Marco Torres, Abogado Marco <laughs> Torres. Um, I really appreciate your time. I know you are extremely busy. Uh, I would first like to start by emphasizing the meaning of this episode for me personally. Uh, growing up, I can't say that I had access to individuals and careers that I aspired to be in or I had as I would even push it as a, as a role model. And you were one of those you were the individual, actually. I wouldn't even say one of those individuals. You were the individual. Um, and I, you've had such an influential... Uh, you've been very influential in my life. And I don't know if I've ever expressed that or I really emphasized it as much as I think I, I should and, and I would like to. But... Um, you have definitely influenced a lot of, of what I'm doing today and the person that I want to continue becoming. So the ability to sit down with you and have this conversation and it be recorded is an absolute honor. Wow. Uh, that's very kind. Thank you. Um, I, I thank you, Gabriella, for inviting me on. It's my pleasure and, and it's, it's an honor for me. And I'm very... You know, I've known you, seen you since you were a little girl, <laughs> and um, it's great to see the woman you've become. I know your mom was very, has been, is very proud of you and all that you've achieved. And likewise, I too, I was very proud and happy to hear of all the successes you've had in your life. It's great to see that, from my point of view too. I I appreciate that. I'm I'm really really excited for this episode. <laughs> I can't. I can't overemphasize it um, when brainstorming season one and season two and this in project, this project entirely, uh, Victoria and I and the rest of the team spoke about how crazy it would be to have you come on. So to actually have you come on and, and this be and this be real is is a is a very meaningful moment, I think, in our journey with this platform. But just in life in general so we're we feel very blessed yeah thank you <laughs> that's very kind uh so let's go ahead and get into it who is marco torres well um i guess right now uh, i'm a lot of different things i'm a husband a father uh, son brother um, an attorney a business owner, and um, I try to be a, a engaged and and um, member of my society and community. I guess the, the general big labels, mm -hmm. smaller things. I'm a surfer. I'm a music aficionado. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of different aspects <laughs> to to my life. I guess mm -hmm. you could say, yeah. And so you. You are born in Puerto Rico. You moved to Los Angeles. Then you moved to D.C. And then you moved to Charleston. Is well, that correct? San Francisco first. Okay, uh, San Francisco. From San, I went, grew up in Los Angeles. Um, went to college in San Francisco. And then moved back to, after college, moved back to Los Angeles for a bit. And that's when I um, then applied to law school. I took a break, about three years in between college and and um, law school, and then moved to D.C. for law school, and then eventually ended up in Charleston. Mm. And it's funny because I've been in Charleston almost as much. I always consider myself a Californian, a L.A. Mm -hmm. kid, um, but I'm, I'm getting to that point now where I've been in South Carolina probably just as long as I did as I grew up and lived in Los Angeles. So mm -hmm. <laughs> it's weird. It's a strange feeling. How so? How long did you live in Puerto Rico? Now we moved. My parents are from Honduras, um, and they got a job offer to to move in Puerto Rico, and they immigrated to Puerto Rico. Um, 
I was my older brother was born there and I was born there. I think at four is when we moved to Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. And my parents um so I spent most of my childhood in, in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. And then um you know, going back, I saw I had some family in Puerto Rico, uh, an aunt and a cousin, and were living there also. And but most of my family was in Honduras, so spent a lot of my childhood going back to Honduras over the summers mm-hmm. and um, visiting family there, and then you know, growing up in LA. Mm. What was it like growing up in LA? At that time, um, LA is a very was a very different city than than um, it is now. Um, it was where I grew up. My parents, you know, they, they were, I'm first generation. My parents, um, you know, when they moved to, on, to from Puerto Rico to, on, to L.A., we didn't have much money. So we grew up, I grew up in the housing projects in Los Angeles, which were very diverse because, um, you know, besides uh, our family, Central Americans, um, there are some, you know, Mexican families, Mexican-American families. But we also had a lot of refugees, Vietnamese refugees, because at that time, in the, in the you know, mid to late 70s, there were, you know, Vietnam War was happening. We, had, we were taking in a lot of Vietnamese and Cambodian refugees. So I grew up with a lot of friends from those regions. Um, we had some friends from Native Americans, um, Egyptians. So it was a, like a little UN. <laughs> 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 and we were all just, you know, having fun getting into trouble doing a lot of things that kids do it was fun Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i we were told by your brother earlier this season that you were a swimmer in high school i was a swimmer um you know growing up in in la and we grew up on the west side where the beach we used to ride our bikes to the beach and spend the you know we didn't we had like maybe a dollar in our pocket and we'd spend the whole day at the beach Mm -hmm. (laughs) um so I just fascinated by the beach. I ended up, um, you know, doing all the stuff that you do in California, you know, in California, like stereotypical California. Mm-hmm. I grew up skating and then started boogie boarding the beach and eventually led to surfing. Mm. And, and, you know, the surfing became a big passion of mine. And that's something I still do to this day. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because, you know, I grew up in, you know, as first generation, you know, in, in that time too, I think I mentioned this to you earlier. At that time, you know, the culturally they didn't embrace biculturalism like they do now. Diversity wasn't embraced. It was more of you got to assimilate to the culture. And um, and I grew up with these this dynamic between these two cultures because I didn't feel I was fully American, mm. whatever that means, you know, which meant like, you know white Anglo-Saxon, I guess. And I didn't feel like I was when I would go to Honduras, my family, they didn't consider me Honduran. It's like, you're American. Mm. So it was this weird dynamic. And then, you know, my interests were, you know, a lot. once I started getting into the skating and the surfing, most of my friends at that time, who were like Latino, Hispanic, weren't, were not into different types. That was just not a cultural thing that Latinos did. I mean, mm-hmm. I was the only Latino surfing for on the beach surfer for as long as I can remember. Mm-hmm. It was me and I. We had a friend who was Japanese American, and we were like the diversity on the beach <laughs> at that time. <laughs> um, so it, it it created some tension too because my friends who were my Latino friends were like, "What are you doing? What? Are you, why are you trying to be white?" And, mm. then, and it's like I'm not trying to be white. I'm just this is just what was interesting to me. And mm-hmm. So it was interesting dynamics mm-hmm. growing up. But yeah, but that led to the surfing, and then that led me to, in high school, I joined the swim team and um, started swimming and swam in high school. And I think there's a, a lot of correlation between swimming and surfing because mm-hmm. you, you want to get better and stronger. So I, I swam in high school and then I swam in junior college for, yeah. Mm. What made you choose uh, to pursue a Bachelor of Arts in English? Um, I guess, writing I guess it felt I, I I enjoyed reading and writing and writing was probably came easiest to me I had a lot of teachers a teacher in high school who one of my, you know one of you you have these teachers who influence you in, in high school and one teacher took a liking to me and 
saw that I had some potential in my writing and really pushed me. And and then, I, you know, I, I was doing a lot of creative writing. I, when I got, um, I didn't know I was going to go to college because no one in my family went to college. I wasn't around anyone who went to college. And I think what made what made me go to college was my senior year, all my friends who were applying to colleges, I didn't apply, I didn't take the LSAT, I didn't apply to college because I it just wasn't on my radar, it wasn't something I was thinking about. But then I guess when I started seeing all my friends getting accepted to colleges and then planning to go to college and they all left, I kind of said, you know, it hit me like, wow, maybe that sounds cool, something I want to do. Mm-hmm. So I was lucky to be, be able to go to, you know, ju- we had a really good junior college in my Santa Monica college. I went there, I pl- you know, got in, and I was focused and said, well, I wanted to get to that point of going away to college. It seemed like something fascinating, interesting, like I wanted to do. So I was driven um, and did all my general electives and two years transferred out of junior college and and went to college and and in junior college I started a, a Latino poetry and writing group mm. so I think that was my I was, was and I did a lot of I thought I was going to be a writer for a long time mm-hmm. like a, a poet and a writer and the whole thing um, I did a lot of I was into art I did a lot of around town I would do through this group that I, we, we published a journal in Santa Monica College I did a lot of reading, poetry. <laughs> so I told it, it was a different, it was a, my artistic mm-hmm. bohemian, I guess, phase of my life mm-hmm. <laughs> at that point. Yeah. That, that is incredibly interesting. What, what do you think influenced your, you, I guess, wanting to be more of that artist? Um, I just, just drawn to that. I had a lot of friends who were artists. Um, and and my brother's an artist. My older brother, um, he went to you know he went to art school and he's a great artist and, and surrounded myself with a lot of artistic people. And I did you know I, I did poetry readings around town back then. Mm-hmm. I, I even did performance art for a while, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is a big change for my life now. But it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> but it was fun. It was mm-hmm. it was a good period. And then so I guess I just gravitated to writing. And then I realized. And then when I tr- when I transferred to, I went to San Francisco State University as a part of the California State system. When I went there, I was, then I had to make a decision, was I gonna focus on creative writing or English lit? And somehow, um, I was drawn more to the English lit and kind of my my creative writing era kind of, I stopped, I stopped, you know, writing, I focused more on you know English literature and read and I just enjoyed to read so if I could get a degree by just reading all the time Mm -hmm. and writing papers and and writing came naturally naturally to me so that's how I ended up in that major did you ever feel the pressure growing up so you said no one went to college your older your oldest brother I would assume your oldest brother pursued a career in as an artist Did you ever feel pressure of going or choosing a career that was going to bring you money? <laughs> That's funny. Um, no, and, and, and my parents, you know, they were very, you know, even though my parents never, we never discussed college in, growing up in my house. It just wasn't a thing in our radar. Um, but once I made the decision, enrolled in Santa Monica College and made the decision to transfer, they were very supportive. Mm-hmm. which was, you know, a blessing. They were always very supportive of whatever we wanted to do. So they encouraged, they encouraged us once we were in that path, and they supported us as much as they could, and they supported us a lot. Um, but they never, no, they didn't ever pressured us to, to, you know, get a you know, reasonable degree. Mm-hmm. Where I did feel the pressure, actually, when, when I would go back to Honduras to visit my family. Mm-hmm. And, you know, my cousins in Honduras, you know, it's a different cultural mindset there. Most people study business administration or pre-med or the liberal arts is in, in, 
it's not something a lot of people pursue there for mm -hmm. a lot of reasons. So when I would go back to Honduras, my cousins and my aunts and uncles would ask me, was, well, what are you studying? And I'd say English literature. They'd laugh and they'd say, you know, if you're in Honduras, you'd die of hunger <laughs> with, that, <laughs> with that major. <laughs> so that was funny. Yeah. It's really, so at what point in your undergrad career, or was it post undergrad career, did you decide that law school was something you wanted to pursue? I didn't know I was going to do law school in undergrad. I never took the LSAT while I was in, in undergraduate. I, you know, I graduated. Actually, I was, my last year, I was thinking I would maybe go into teaching. Mm -hmm. It was a lit major. There's certain career paths for a literature major, you know, publishing, I guess, or, or teaching or, or being a writer in some kind of um, field of writing. So for a little bit, I thought I was going to be a teacher and teach literature. And I actually did my last semester. My last year was in the teaching credential program mm -hmm. and taught and was a teacher's assistant at a high school in Mission High School in, in, in San Francisco. And then I realized after that semester of being a, a student teacher, a teacher's assistant, like a it was tough, you know, the, it was an inner city school and the kids deserved, I thought, in my opinion, the kids deserve someone who who wants to be there and knows, because these kids deserve, you know, the focus and the attention and, and, and they deserve the best they can get as a teacher. And I realized like maybe I wasn't in a position right there in my life to be able to provide the kids what they needed mm. as a teacher. So then, then I changed my, then I went back to LA after college and I worked at a research institute, a museum in the research institute for a couple of years. And then I ended up in working for MGM in the legal department. Mm -hmm. And then I met and I was working with a lot of attorneys. And at that point, I kind of knew I wanted to go back to school, graduate school. And I was trying to decide whether to continue get a you know master's in latin american studies i was a latin american studies minor oh okay so i really enjoyed so i was thinking maybe go back to graduate school and getting a degree in latin american studies um i wanted to write about latin america and write some books about i was still you know had the, and I, the dreams of being a writer mm -hmm. <laughs> and i was thinking maybe write some books about latin america and and then you know i started thinking how can i affect you know, most effect on people's lives and be effective in the Latino culture and stuff. And 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 I figured, and then I realized that talking to the lawyers who I was working with, like law school is a quicker way of empowerment to make changes in people's lives and in the community. So that's how I, then I decided, you know, I'll tr take the LSAT, apply to law school and that's how I ended up in law school. How were your parents, how did your parents respond to you pursuing a law degree? They were very supportive. Yeah. Once I I told them like I I was interested in that, they were very supportive. They mm -hmm. were they were excited mm -hmm. about that possibility. Mm. Did you while in law school, did you ever doubt if that was the place that you needed to be or were you certain? Um, I don't think I doubted, um, you know, it, 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 sometimes you feel there were things that I think coming from my background that made it more difficult. If I can go back, if I knew what I know now, there are things I would do, you know, differently because a lot of law students, you know, come from they have a family member the parents are lawyers or they have a family member lawyers they didn't know lawyers and then they have that counseling they advise them like you know what to do i felt like um there were a lot of things i could have done differently had i known if someone told me things to do while i was in the process of for example like there's things law school is very competitive mm -hmm. and and it's law school is very competitive getting into law school while you're in law school everyone's high achievers everyone's competing against everyone else and everyone and the ultimate goal is you know you want to get this corporate job or you want to get a clerkship 
or and there's steps you have to take to get to set yourself up for that mm -hmm. and i just didn't know because no one told me i didn't have a guide a, you know someone like for example like you gotta a, you know write for and get on the journals law journals no one told me that and 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 you know you got to seek these internships and and do all this stuff and and having those connections and having that i think people who come from a different background have that i guess it's a that benefit which i didn't have so did i doubt myself no were there things that that could have i could have benefited from having more um, and known lawyers and people have gone through it more and can help me tell me well, this is what you want to mm -hmm. guide me through yes I think it would have been beneficial knowing what you know now how would you approach networking throughout law school I think you know definitely make those connections you know know what you want even if you don't know what you want to do try it out and law school is a good opportunity to know what you, to make sure you know what you don't want to do. Mm. So go out there and, and, you know, I think getting out there, getting internships in areas, if you try, you know, a corporate, try a nonprofit, try the different government. I think that's the opportunity to get yourself into all these doors and see, and you'll see people working in this area and you'll realize like, I do like that or I don't like that. I think expose yourself to as much as you can. It's, it's important. Mm -hmm. So graduating law school, what what did you did you know you wanted to pursue immigration law during law school? No, not necessarily. I didn't, um, which which is too bad because my law school had a great <laughs> immigration program and I was I was doing a lot of uh, other things. Um, but. Getting out of law school, I, I met my wife in law school, and after law school, she get, ended up getting a federal clerkship, which is a very prestigious position with a federal judge in South Carolina, and that's what brought us to South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And then I started working for the public defender's office, and 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 I really enjoyed that. That was, I think, you know, the career paths ended up being a very fortunate to end it up in the public defender's office because it's the opportunity you get as a first year lawyer it, it both from the public defenders and also like prosecutor's office it, it, you can't match that in in private or government because they hand you your cases they mm -hmm. want like, these are your cases go and you're in front of a judge arguing within you know weeks of graduating from law school you're in court by yourself mm -hmm. and obviously you have the support of others you know more senior attorneys in the office and stuff but you're arguing motions you're trying cases within your you know sometimes within your first year of graduating i mean with another areas of law you know some associates never see the courtroom mm -hmm. never try a case some of the lawyers go through their whole career never trying the case so it was a great experience and you're fighting for me it was, um, I think it was a, a very beneficial, especially in Charleston. You know, Charleston is, uh, back then, this is what we're talking about, 20 years, 20-something years ago, at, it was a very small Latino population in South Carolina. It was growing, and it's grown, expedient, you know, it's grown dramatically in the last 10 years. By that time, there weren't very many. It was a small community, and there weren't, any other Latino attorneys mm -hmm. in Charleston that I, that I was aware of, and, and then not only that, but no other Spanish-speaking attorneys. So when I got in, when I got to the office, everyone was so excited that I spoke Spanish, and all the Spanish cases, all the <laughs> everyone dumped all their Spanish-speaking clients on me. They're like, "Here you go," and and um, back then they didn't. It was interesting. It was like the the Wild West. They didn't have the services for that you needed for the non-english speaking defendants you know public defender it's all you know criminal defense i mean it was crazy the stuff when i first got to these courts there was no one there were no translators no one was translating they would find literally they would find whoever like sometimes kids that would come in with a family member mm -hmm. they'd serve as a as a translator interpreter it was mm -hmm. crazy so um 
things have gotten better now. They realize, like, you know, now there's interpreters. Now, you know, they, they make sure that people understand their rights. And, I mean, they were finding anybody who's, people who can half speak Spanish to translate in a court proceeding, mm. you know, trying to understand your rights, you know, giving up rights, your, you have possibility of jail time. It was, um, so I got lucky by, I think, uh, unwittingly moving to Charleston and being a Latino attorney in Charleston at that time professionally was very beneficial for me. I had I gone to back to California, being a bilingual Latino, there, you know, there's hundreds of them. Mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. But being in, in South Carolina, I was one of one of only or very few. So it created for me a lot of opportunities to grow, to help a lot of people and exposure and, and that I, I think opportunities I wouldn't have had somewhere else. So four years after you received your JD, you started your own law firm. Um, when did I start? Like, yeah, was it four years? I don't remember. You graduated <laughs> from your, you graduated 2001 and you started your law firm in 2005. Correct, yes. So I was in the public defender's office for almost two years and then I got recruited to work at a at a civil litigation firm so I worked for them for almost two years you're right and then I started doing some work in that they had a lot they were doing a lot of work in Puerto Rico so I was traveling in Puerto Rico a lot but then I had clients people here we started doing some civil litigation like um, wrongful um, Fair Labor Standards Act violation cases people who were getting paid or you know labor dispute issues in the Latino community mm -hmm. so I started getting involved in these types of cases and then meeting a lot of the migrant community in South Carolina going and doing a lot of talks to churches and about rights and benefits and I was being and I realized no one was serving this community that was growing and, and they needed services and I think as was what driving factor me opening my own firm, seeing that there was a need in the, in the Latino community that no one was serving at that time. I think that's what drove me, that's what inspired me to, to open up my own practice. And you know, it's a, it's, it's a leap of faith. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, one thing in law school, they don't, you know, cause up until that point I was in the public defender's office and I was in a firm. So once you open up your own practice, it's a profession, the legal profession, but it's also a business once you go out on your own. And one thing law school doesn't teach you is the business side of, unless you seek that out, but they don't. So I had to learn how to be a businessman and, and, and at the same time running this the practice, the legal practice. So it was challenging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Is it common for lawyers four years out of law school to go out and start their own firm? Um, it used to be a lot more common back then. I mean, it used to be back, you know, we're talking 40 years ago, 30 years ago. A lot of people would go out and, and you know, hang a shingle, they said, hang your own shingle. And, and it was more common most now most people end up going into you know working either for a firm or working for the government or nonprofit or or some other fields that the law degree can take you in um i don't, I don't know how common it is but you know n most people don't do it right away yeah i'd be really curious to understand to look a little deeper into those stats because to go right highlighting the okay now you're starting a business and where your sales are at is extremely and only influenced by you so what what challenges did you see going out and starting your own business business right what challenges did you face throughout that well, it's just, you know, I was, again, we talked about earlier, I was a lit major. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I was not good at math. 
<laughs> math is not my strong point in business. You know, I never had any business training. So just learning to run a business was was a really steep learning curve. And I got, I ended up um, the, joining the, the Charleston County, um, what is it, the Chamber of Commerce? Mm-hmm. And the Chamber of Commerce offered this program, which was great. It was called, um, God, I forget the name. Um, but it's older, it's retired CEOs, business people who train young entrepreneurs mm-hmm. in business. So you, you, you have to apply for this course. And I applied and I got a grant, which was nice, that paid for the course. And they basically, it's a, I forget how many weeks it was, but you, through, the, through, the, through the process of this course, you get trained in marketing, accounting, you by the end of the course you, you, you start off you design a business plan mm-hmm. by the end of the course you design your business plan and we had and you know all the students in this class were in different fields anything from you know people starting a small business for a cleaning business a, you know, real estate accounting it was a big mix of, of different people and and I think that was very beneficial mm-hmm. for me um, just a crash course in mm-hmm. <laughs> in business one on one, you know, and that, and then you know, there, and then um, learning marketing, getting yourself out there, and one of the reasons, again, that I think was helpful for me, seeing the need in in Charleston at the time for a Latino, you know, a bilingual attorney who's serving the needs of the Latino community. I wasn't competing with every other lawyer, you know. Mm. I wasn't. I didn't go out and hang a shingle and try to, you know, compete with the attorneys who've been established for thirty years, who've got the resources to, you know, to advertise for. I didn't have the money to, you know, go out there and put, you know, get on TV. I didn't have the money to do this, so I wasn't. So I think for me, it was beneficial. I wasn't competing with all these other attorneys. I had a niche that I was going after. I think was beneficial for me mm-hmm. at that time. Um, I think that was that was helpful, but it, it was challenging. It was tough mm-hmm. <laughs> learning. And at the same time, you know, you you um, you have your case, so you know. At the same time, you have to you know to be profitable. You have to have a certain amount of cases coming through the door. So you, when you're by yourself, you're getting these cases, getting them. But then you also have to work these cases. All of a sudden, you know, you got a criminal case that's you got to gear up for this you got a civil case that you got to gear up for that and i think the way i fell into immigration it's because that's was a need in that in the community people wanted immigration services there are no other i have a colleague who's a friend of mine who's robert condy who's actually shares an office with me still today him and i started together um, and we helped, and then another friend of mine in Columbia, um, Charles Phipps, the three of us started our practices around the same time. And there were very few immigration attorneys in the state, and it was beneficial to have us three helping each other out. We were just get on the phone, like, and that was very beneficial. But um, that's how I got into immigration law because I just, that's what people wanted services for. They needed that. And, and immigration law is, it's tough. It's a, it's a very, it's a, it's a very specialized area of law. It's administrative, and it it, it it's like it, there's it's administrative. It's federal. It's it's it, it's got all these different types of statutes from different sources where you got to reference, and it's changing all the time. Immigration law changes with the whims of the government, so it's a strong learning curve. But and I think that's why there a lot of people don't get into it because it's it's not it's not something you can just jump in one day and start practicing. It takes a long time to to develop a, an expertise in that area. So 2005, it's 2023, and I know we have a limited amount of time, and this is a loaded question. But uh, 18 years have passed. How would you describe that journey? Um it's it's been you know it's been a good overall it's been a great a great journey there's been ups and downs challenges here and there um and always trying to learn 
and always trying to do things better. Efficiency is something as a business owner you strive for. Mm -hmm. um, being efficient, but also being, um, also learned a lot of, about what kind of cases I want to do and don't want to do. Um, there are a lot of cases that I did earlier in my career just because you need to. You know, they're kind of like what you say when you start your practice, you, you know, whatever comes, whatever case comes to the door, you're, you're like, you're taking it. Mm -hmm. But getting to the point now, I think, which is beneficial is getting to a point where I've established myself, where I know what I want, the cases I want to handle, the cases I don't. And I don't have to, I'm not in a position, thankfully, where I have to take whatever case comes through the door. And there's another thing about life, work balance is important. Get to the point where you, you can have you've built yourself up a practice you know and to the point where you can then scale back a little and make sure you don't forget about your personal life and your mm -hmm. children i have young children so being a business owner too you have that flexibility as a business owner if i need my son or my daughter has this function at school at four o'clock i'm going mm -hmm. you know because it's important because those moments are you know fleeting mm -hmm. eventually they're going to graduate and move off and be gone so mm -hmm. um learning at this point in my life i think it's been beneficial to get the business to the point where i can balance that life between work and life, personal life where do you see yourself going in the future uh where do i see myself going Professionally and personally. <laughs> Professionally, um, I want to, you know, it, I want to get back. Early on, I was doing a lot. I want to get to the point when my now when my children are, are getting older now and finishing, like get back to more, which I haven't done in a while, more civic involvement because it's just tough when mm -hmm. you have young kids and you have this. It's just something's got to give you can't do everything mm. and early on i was involved in more organizations and groups and other things outside of work then you get to a point where you're dealing with young kids and this and that and and, you, and something's got to give so i guess down the road i want to give go back and 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 do more civic work be you know i used to be on did a lot more work and did on was on boards uh, for organizations and did this and I taught for during the early part of my career um, I taught legal courses at the college here and and things like that which fell off I mean get and professionally get more involved in those kind of activities personally I think also keep balancing that that you know don't forget about my you know work my private life and 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 um Make sure I'm doing the things that make me happy too outside of work. I mean, I enjoy being a lawyer. I enjoy this, the work that I do. I think the immigration work is very stressful. It can be very stressful because people's lives they're depending on you. A lot of times, you're you're, you know, what you do can keep a family together or, or the family can be separated. So it's a lot of pressure, but it's very rewarding at the same time when you have success in the immigration field and in the criminal field too um, you change people's lives and you, you, they'll remember you and you remember them and you, you form these connections because together you, you go through this you know taxing emotional journey and mm -hmm. if you're successful it's, it's very rewarding so I enjoy that mm. what advice do you have for someone that is trying to figure out what career to choose um, what advice? Just don't be afraid to try. I mean, if you try it, whatever you interest, you try it, and you'll realize if it does not doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. It doesn't mean you fail. There's no failure, and and trying and not you just realize you didn't you, that wasn't for you, and try the next thing. Just don't be afraid to try. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> what would what do you think your younger self would think? of the person you've become today? Um, they'd be surprised. 
<laughs> <laughs> be surprised by a lot of things. Um, surprised that that my younger self would be surprised that I, that I became a lawyer. That I live in South Carolina. <laughs> Even being an L.A. kid, yeah. I didn't even know where South Carolina was. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so you'd be surprised by that. And just to be, reach a, a level, of, you know, to be a professional and, and engage and enjoy my work and to have the family I have now, it's, it's a blessing. I've been blessed. My younger self would be surprised. Mm. <laughs> would not something I saw as a trajectory I envisioned when I was a kid in my life. Mm. Yeah, pleasantly surprised. <laughs> it's always really interesting to have these conversations because where we started and and where we're at now in life, you know, sometimes we have a plan or sometimes we think we know what our life should look like or and then you have different challenges or you believe that at some point you wanted to pursue creative writing and, and an artist was it. And then something ha something changed. So to be able to see that ability to adapt throughout your story and then to also embrace different chapters too, becoming a business owner, starting your own firm, moving to South Carolina, um, taking swimming lessons that wasn't typical or wasn't seen as embracing your latino culture and and embracing that inter intersectionality of being under an american um is is very beautiful and i think very encouraging as well um so i i really appreciate your time and i really appreciate your story as well um as i mentioned before just you being who you are and, and existing is motivating and influencing to me and I believe to many others as well. Being a uh, first generation lawyer, first, I'm sorry, first generation college student, first generation lawyer as well. Um, but what what you're doing, it very much entails like my ancestors' wildest dreams, that phrase. So I, I'm, I'm very grateful for your time and, and that you allowed us to record your story and then publish it in the future. Oh, thank you. I, I appreciate you asking me. It's, it's, like I said, it's, it's, it's an honor for me. Thank you. I appreciate you wanting to interview me. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I hope this can be beneficial to a, a person who, like I was, can see this and see that there's that you can work hard and and everything's possible it's just focus and, and work <laughs> absolutely thank you this is atrevete a lo imposible season two episode seven Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Ali. Our episodes are available on YouTube and Spotify. Visit Ali.club to learn more about our mission, our team, and our guests. Follow us on social media. And as always, atrévete a lo imposible.